and then dianabol is like roughly equivalent to that of the physiologic replacement amount of TRT at like What's up guys, Derek, more place, more Today we're going to be talking about examples of test bases. So a lot of um, people have a misconception about what a test base is. If you don't know what a test base is, I recommend you watch my first video explaining what the point of a test base is. I'll put a card up in the corner to uh, one of my past videos on test bases. And if you want a more elaborate deep dive, you can check out my articles on moreplacemoredates.com. And I highly recommend you subscribe to the newsletter there if you want to get deep dives into bodybuilding pharmacology when I publish them, but this video is going to be covering specifically just the compounds themselves rather than explaining why or how a test base works. I'm just going to detail the compounds I feel at least off the top of my head. Like I might be missing some to be honest because I can only retain so much information too guys. So uh, maybe I might miss some, but off the top of my head, this is a video idea that just popped in my head and I want to make a, make a post on it. Basically everything that I feel is able to provide sufficient estrogen receptor activation, basically. So one of the first things, obviously testosterone. Everyone knows testosterone. This is why it is the staple base of every single cycle you see. If you wanna see why that is, you can check out the video, like I said. But testosterone, it's the base of almost every single steroid cycle, and there's a reason for that. This is the first test base. It is literally <laughs> test itself. Um, now, there's some indirect ways to get to testosterone, which is the next thing we're going to get into, which is, and when I say get to testosterone, that's not necessarily the end goal. The end goal is to get to a sufficient amount of estradiol. So there are other ways to get to that end goal, all but not optimal, like it would be with testosterone or as predictable, but still doable nonetheless in the majority of these cases. So the next one is DHEA, oral DHEA. A lot of people don't realize that DHEA in clinical studies is actually very poor at increasing male testosterone levels. However, it's very effective at increasing estradiol levels. Now that may sound counterintuitive considering the way you get to estradiol is through testosterone aromatizing to estradiol, but if you want to dig into the clinical literature to see for yourself, you'll see the disproportionate rise in estradiol relative to females who take the same dose. Now, is this just because males have a certain amount of testosterone? So it's kind of like preferentially, you know, increased amounts of aromatization because they already have a baseline amount of testosterone kind of like fulfilled. So then the body just shoves the rest down the aromatase pathway. You know, I don't really know for sure. Digging into that, I should go look into that further. But at the end of the day, the main thing you can take away from that is, you know, like 25 to 50 milligrams of DHEA per day can result in a pretty dis substantial spike in estradiol levels. Like I know some guys who've done uh, nandrolone only cycles um, who use DHEA in conjunction with it to reach a, you know, a adequate level of estradiol. Maybe not optimal, but adequate. Nonetheless, instead of being estrogen deficient, they at least had a physiologic amount that would have otherwise been equivalent to that of a physiologic amount coming from testosterone if they were on like HRT or something. So DHEA, this is where it kind of lines up on the, uh, so I'm going to defer to the steroidogenesis um, chart here just to give a visual representation. This is something I'm going to refer to a few times in this video. Um, so if we have DHEA, it can go through three beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase to androstenedione, and from there, it can either go through aromatization into estrone, which can then go down into estradiol, or you can have androstenedione go through 17 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase to testosterone, which then gets aromatized into estradiol too. So there's different ways it can go about it, or it can go through this again here: 17 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase to androstenedione. Diol, which then goes through three beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase to testosterone and consequently estradiol. So there's different ways your body can uh, partition sort of this uh, metabolism of sex hormones. But basically DHEA is higher up in the cascade of uh, steroid genesis to eventually lead to the testosterone and estradiol outcome. But it's it's in the endogenous steroid genesis like framework. It's not like this is some foreign substance. This is something you naturally produce. If you're introducing an exogenous certain amount of it, you can reach the same end goal, even if you're shut down, 
um, at least with a physiologic amount to some extent. And, and this is just like an oral over the counter thing. Um, so the next thing we're going to be going over is the uh, HCG. So this is something that a lot of people wouldn't even think of. And to be honest, it has some interesting uh, potential implications. Maybe implications implications isn't the right word. Maybe it's uh, potentially a, may thera a more therapeutic outcome as a base for some cycles, potentially. Reason being, it's not going to have the same uh, rough impact on SHBG as a bolus dose of testosterone would. In addition to that, it seems to um, disproportionately spike estrogen production. So like more so than you would get from a I don't know, a parallel amount of testosterone exogenously that you would otherwise pin. Now, I'm not trying to assert that it would be beneficial for people to use an LH mimic as their test base. That's not what I'm trying to say. But in certain scenarios for guys with um, that need to improve their lipid profile or have low SHBG, it may, uh, you know, be worth exploring in some context. But basically, HCG is used in males to stimulate the late cells to synthesize testosterone. So this is um, commonly used in um, on cycle or in uh, you know post cycle therapy contexts for uh, recovery and whatnot. It's often not leveraged as a test base, but it certainly could be. Um, you know, there's ways I think it could be deployed potentially in a smart way in that context. So it's basically used to. Um, artificially kind of like mimic luteinizing hormone and then stimulate intratesticular testosterone production. And from there, you can obviously get a physiologic amount of testosterone from that, which then in turn is going to result in estradiol. So that is something that may work and actually may have a uh, favorable, more favorable impact on certain health markers for some individuals in specific scenarios. So that is another, uh, you know, like test base that could uh, potentially work for fulfilling that pathway. Next up is 4-Andro. So this is a pro-hormone that is commonly sold over the counter nowadays and by a lot of supplement companies. And I'm not going to really say it's super viable. I think it's probably the worst option, in my opinion, for reaching a end outcome of a sufficient amount of testosterone, but it still gets the job done. The problem is it's a lot less predictable than these other things, which we have like clinical data to reference exactly what is going to convert to what and kind of like hypothesize where you're going to land when you use a certain dose. Basically, what you're getting is a, um, a pro-hormone to androstene diol, which is then converted to testosterone. And the proportion by which it does that, it's kind of unclear because, you know, you'll see statistics about the conversion rate of androstene diol is about 15.76% to testosterone. But when you have these blends of like different kinds of uh, 4 DHEA in these uh, supplements, you don't really know exactly what kind of amount you're getting that is eventually leading to whatever amount of testosterone, which is leading to however much estrogen. Like there's a lot of kind of guesswork that it comes with for andro. With that being said, it does yield some testosterone, which then yields some estrogen. So it can fulfill this pathway indirectly. It's just a bit more uh, complicated of a process. Um, next up, we get to um, the anabolic steroid family tree and we look at other stuff besides testosterone that um, can fulfill this pathway. So there's not a whole lot of compounds and often when you look at the uh, testosterone derivatives category, you'll look to things like, you'll assume that, okay, testosterone, EQ and D-ball are the you know test bases is what was commonly thought for a while. We thought, okay, testosterone, we know that is the kind of like 100% proportional amount of, you know, physiologic 5-alpha reduction to DHT, aromatization to estrogen. Everyone knows exactly what to expect from that. Then boldenone is the one that converts at 50% the rate of testosterone to estradiol. And then dianabol is like roughly equivalent to that of the physiologic replacement amount of TRT at like it's like you'll usually see a replacement amount of D-ball being 10 to 15 milligrams is kind of like physiologic replacement for men um, where you can get sufficient estradiol. Well, we're not actually getting a sufficient amount of estradiol. We're actually getting a sufficient amount of 17 alpha methyl estradiol, which has a similar potency for um, activating estrogen receptors. So it can uh, also fulfill that pathway. It's just a bit more extrapolating as to where the replacement amount is. Obviously, in more recent years, or very recent, I would say, we've learned, come to learn that certain things that we thought were adequate as test bases are actually fucking horrible, like EQ. It's like the most garbage compound as a test base, in my opinion, at least based on what I've seen. It literally makes your test base not, 
not even work when you're using it with test. So on its own, how good do you think it's going to be? Not that good from what I can tell. So I would write off EQ entirely and it certainly does not seem to aromatize to 50 per, at 50% the rate of testosterone to estradiol. And even if it does aromatize, which it does seem to interact with aromatase, it certainly is not producing bioidentical estradiol. It's producing something else. So I don't know why this was ever proposed as a logical outcome, in my opinion, especially when you literally have D-ball, which is producing methyl estradiol, which is not normal estradiol. Like you would think a synthetic compound is going to produce some sort of analog rather than the bioidentical hormone itself, which is an expected outcome. So expecting a proportional 50% spit out of, of uh, bioidentical estradiol seemed kind of ridiculous to me. But that's something I fed into for years too. So, you know, it's not, uh, you know, I'm not trying to uh, shit on the idea. Well, I am trying to shit on the idea, but I'm just saying, um, you know, we always learn new things. And um, EQ, you know, that's something I learned as of recent that I think is uh, definitely not going to fall into the test-based category anymore. Um, as far as what else? Honestly, not much. We can look at the only other thing that I would put on the table is Trestolone, also known as Ment. And this is something that's been looked at for a potential contraceptive for males and um, does have interaction with aromatase, pretty significant. And it is uh, proposed to be even more estrogenic than testosterone. However, in the clinical literature, what we see is interesting outcomes when you look at Trestolone for HRT. The problem is, when you're looking at it for HRT, the dose may not be high enough to yield the estrogenic outcome we're looking for because the androgenicity is typically very underestimated when it comes to trestolone. So the dosages used for contraception in these studies are yielding a very weak estrogenic activity. It converts to 7-alpha methyl estradiol, not to be confused with the methyl estradiol that Dianabol converts into, but the estrogenic activity seems insufficient for replacement purposes, at least in the literature we see on it to date. Again, this, is, this isn't bodybuilder dosages though, but still, we see decreased bone mineral density in men treated with it for hypogonadism, which is not a good sign, especially when it's a progestogenic compound that you would otherwise expect to upregulate aromatase expression. So something that is um, in itself interacting with aromatase upregulates aromatase expression through its progestogenic activities um, doesn't seem to produce uh, the outcome we're looking for. And it's certainly not predictable either. So, you know, Trestolone is something I'm going to uh, get back to and kind of do a, I, I want to do a comparison video between it and uh, some of the other test bases I mentioned as far as, you know, is this something viable you could use as a replacement for test for testosterone as a test base in a cycle or, you know, for TRT. That's another video because that's going to be, uh, I'm already at the 15 minute mark and delving into uh, seven alpha methyl estradiol is going to be an entire uh, deep dive in itself. But at the end of the day, those are the only compounds that I feel um, can function potentially as test bases. You know, you have things like nandrolone is obviously something that's commonly debated. Um, it doesn't actually convert at 20% the rate of testosterone either. Um, in my opinion, and it doesn't even seem to convert to estradiol at all. It converts potentially to estrone or some other synthetic analog that is cross-reacting as estrone and then as a byproduct may convert back to estradiol at insufficient amounts. Having a single digit estradiol is not adequate to provide neuroprotection and cardioprotection on a massive dose of androgens in my opinion. And we see this backed up at least you know, again, we don't see this in humans really because it's not like you're ever going to see a study on this. But when you see, you know, what happens to neurotoxicity outcomes when you introduce an aromatase inhibitor versus remove it, stuff like that, you see kind of like, like no change whatsoever. It's just neurotoxic as fuck regardless. So, you know, it sort of leans me in the direction of, you know, it's probably not a sufficient substrate for aromatase. Um, with that being said, it's certainly better than fucking zero, which is what a lot of these compounds are doing. Um, or even anti-estrogenic, like some of these uh, DHC derivatives and whatnot. So, um, you know, there's obviously things like anadrol, which may impact, like, increase the estrogenicity of other compounds used concurrently due to its, uh, you know, effect on the body's hepatic clearance of estrogens in the body or progestogenic compounds or GH or whatever that can increase aromatase expression. But, you know, as a monotherapy, like looking at one compound, is this one compound not you know, piled with other drugs going to be sufficient on its own. Like if you did a single blast or a single, you know, like alternative form of hormone replacement therapy with this one thing provide enough estrogen receptor activation. Um, the things I mentioned at the start, 
the testosterone, the DHEA, the HCG, the 4-andro, the Dianabol, potentially Trestolone. These are the things I would look at the most seriously. The other ones, everything else in the anabolic steroid family tree is kind of uh, not even worth evaluating from what I've seen in terms of a viable test base um, because most of them just don't interact, uh, aren't potent substrates for aromatase at all or potentially have anti-estrogenic attributes in themselves, which is obviously, you know, not advantageous in a monotherapy context. So... That's basically where it stands, dude. You know, I think testosterone and D-ball kind of have the most uh, literature backing them as like HRT replacements. HCG monotherapy is not really a popular means of HRT either, but it is certainly uh, more viable in my opinion than something like boldenone. Um, but anyways, I'm not proposing any of these are, you know, smart outcomes. I'm just saying in terms of which things can be test bases, this, this seems to be the compounds that could potentially fulfill that pathway. So I'm gonna have more videos in the future on, uh, you know, D-ball, uh, ment, stuff like that, um, how they could potentially uh, provide that estrogen component and if it's sufficient relative to just like, you know, classic testosterone. But at the end of the day, testosterone is testosterone. It's kind of hard to uh, compare anything to it because your body knows exactly what to do with it and um, at the perfect ratios and, um, you know, the rest of them are kind of a bit more extrapolating that are required with them, but doesn't mean it can't be done. Even the golden era cycles, you look at, um, you know, commonly D-ball bases with uh, Primo on top of them. It's a pretty popular one. So clearly there is um, applications for it. And obviously in the uh, literature, we've seen some of these compounds deployed as HRT alternatives. So, you know, definitely worth looking at at least. And it's very interesting to Dig into, in my opinion, because it's stuff that is uh, not really talked about. So, um, especially the D-ball thing, I think it's pretty funny because it all started out with like D-ball only cycles or like a fucking meme pretty much because of how stupid people think they were. And I was one of those people. I was like, wow, D-ball. I thought D-ball only was decent when I first like learned about steroids when I was in, uh, I don't know how old I was, 18 or 19 or something. When I first learned about it, I was like, oh, I guess a D-ball cycle makes a lot of sense. Like, that seems like what a lot of my friends are doing. <laughs> so maybe I should try that shit. And then a couple of years later, you get into the forums and stuff. And then you start hearing all the veterans who tell you how stupid a D-ball only cycle is. Then you become one of those guys who's like, yeah, D-ball only cycle is fucking terrible. It's a terrible idea. Why the fuck would you ever do that? And then once you get to like next level research, you start to realize <laughs> maybe it's not so stupid after all. So, because you have guys who are doing like fucking Winstrol only for their first cycle and stuff like that. And then, um, like no estrogen, dude. Let's just go in with a DHT derivative and fucking have no estrogen the entire time. Um, anyway, that is, uh, it's just funny how some of the stuff comes full circle. You'll be like, well, that was fucking stupid. And then you'll be like, maybe that wasn't so stupid. And then you learn something else. You're like, that was actually really stupid. And then years later, you're like, I can't believe three times I've changed my mind at this point, and now it's actually not that stupid. So anyways, let me know what you guys think in the comments down below if I missed any test bases that uh, you can think of or exotic compounds that uh, fulfill sufficient estrogen receptor activation, or if you have any thoughts in general, or if you have a creative algorithm comment, they all help and they're all, <laughs> sometimes they're pretty funny. Um, like, subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Follow me on Instagram at more plates under show more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, Bitchu, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. Um, if you want to support the channel, you can check out my TRT clinic. Link in description below. You can save $50 off your first treatment with MPMD50. Just mention it to your patient care coordinator when you are doing, doing your consult with them. It's all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home. FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, whatever is preferable for you. And Basically, they'll go through your bloods A to Z, interpret them for you, address any imbalances or deficiencies you may have, um, refer you to our doctors, uh, one of our doctors who will then make a personalized protocol for you based on your individual needs. If you do um, need anything and it's uh, medically warranted, then they'll get you set up and then all your meds are shipped right to your door. Super convenient, especially in these times. So check that out if you're interested. We cover pretty much everything, not just TRT, hormone optimization, um, peptides, a lot of different stuff. It's worth checking out. Even hair loss, pharma grade hair loss compounds, a lot of stuff that pretty much everything I do is through the clinic. So if you want to check out anything that I might use myself, then, um, you know, we likely carry it through there. As far as uh, Gorilla Mind, Gorilla Mode, if you want to support my nootropic and pre-workout formulas, I designed these myself from scratch. Um, the cognitive enhancing nootropics are basically just to help you stay more focused for more productive hours throughout the day, more creative, more locked in. 
Um, that's what they excel at, and I think they do a pretty damn good job at it for what we can legally include in them. The pre-workout formula, self-explanatory, what those are, um, just pull out your current pre, compare it to the label on Gorilla Mode Classic with the uh, maxed out dose of NO precursors, hyperhydrating agents, plasma expanders, and the cognitive enhancing component um, with the stims in it. It's a top topped out formula with the max efficacious dose in all capacities. Then you move to the stimulant free formula, Gorilla Mode Nitric. This is even slightly more maxed out if that's fucking even possible. Like I literally, there was almost no area of it I could improve from Gorilla Mode. So I had to basically just increase a gram here and there on certain ingredients that I could push a bit harder. Like L-citrulline, the max efficacious dose is 10 grams. So obviously if I need to incentivize the stim free formula in some capacity, the classic formula has nine grams, the, the stim free one has 10. And then we have higher dosages of glycerol, stuff like that, but there's no stimulants in it. So you can actually use it at nighttime and you get a bit more of a, of a kick from the higher dose performance enhancing ingredients. But you know, like I would still classify each formula as maxed out essentially. You're just getting, this one is like to the point where any more of each ingredient would be like severely diminished results. Um, and then the stim formula specifically, this is a cost effective, version of Gorilla Mode Classic essentially without any of the performance enhancing ingredients, no NO precursors, no hyperhydrating agents. It's just the cognitive enhancing component, but boost it up a bit more, like right to the edge of, this is probably a bit too much. <laughs> it's for people who are stim junkies or otherwise just wanna get the cognitive enhancing component from a pre-workout at a more cost-effective price point without all the other stuff. So if that interests you, check it out. Anything else I'm associated with, video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.